long string gradients and locations for their history in New York. So let me apologize a bit because I'm a little hoarse. So I'm going to hold the mic up to my mouth like I'm at a, a dance recital here. Um, but in any case, what I'm going to talk about today is American Brook Lamp Ray. And what you can see up here is a pretty good size distribution of animals you might find in the stream. This, of course, would be a young of year animal. Um, and then animals like this are the adult that would be out breeding uh, if you go out in the fall or into the spring in this field. So American Brook Lamprey are like sea lamprey in some ways, um, but they are not quite as well distributed across the state of New York. But they are the second most common lamprey in New York. They tend to be found down in the Allegheny and the Genesee River. Um, but there are a number of uh, uh, populations up here in the St. Lawrence River as well, or in St. Lawrence drainages. There are some sporadic populations elsewhere in the state. But I'm going to spend my time today talking about animals I collected primarily in the Genesee River, but I am going to mention some So American brook lamprey are not traditional like you think of a fish. Uh, they actually exhibit a life history that's really similar to aquatic invertebrates. So this life history is primarily dominated by a relatively sedentary larva, or what we call an amnesty. And then there's a short uh, period where they undergo a metamorphosis, and then they become an adult. And that adult his, uh, life period is, is the period in which the animal recovers probably the lost distance that it just has. Uh, traveled when it was a larvae, so the downstream movement is recovered in the adults. So they probably move upriver, uh, reproduce, and then they produce more larvae. American brook lamprey are not like sea lamprey, which is what we think of again as traditional lamprey. And even when you talk about sea lamprey, you're talking about uh, usually the juvenile period where there's a lot of parasitic feeding. American brook lamprey never feed parasitically, so there can be tons of American brook lamprey, uh, and never a drop of fish blood was ever uh, uh, spared. <laughs> They're relatively common in different locations of the state. Uh, this is a good example of a habitat where you'd expect to find them. This is up uh, <coughs> the St. Lawrence River. There's lots of soft sediments here, so areas like these pools. The water tends to be relatively slow flowing. You often find them, or you will hear people talk about finding them in the headwater streams. They're very common there as well. Then you can find them first, second, third, and even four border streams. So in this area, I actually did sample. There were uh, brook trout that lived right here in, the, in this uh, pool, but there were lots and lots of American brook plant uh throughout that area. And in this case, it's all the larvae, right? So they're all buried. You wouldn't necessarily even see them, but these are actually the most common fish that was in that pool when I went out and sampled. So a lot of lampreys have a migratory period, and that's that adult period where they're actually going out and breeding. And when we think of that, we, we tend to think of the big obvious ones, the lamprey again, are common ones. And people have looked a bit at uh, what is, how, how can we actually know how much they're migrating in their life, and are they using different stream habitats. This is a size distribution from a uh, different species called the pouch lamprey in New Zealand. And what you can see is some really obvious patterns here. A bunch of very, very small animals, or very, very large animals, are collected very close to the outlet, to the mouth of a river. And then what tend to be very, very small animals collected further upstream. And what I wanted to see is, does that pattern also hold for American brook lamprey? Do, they, do you also get a pattern of size distribution? So do you get a bunch of small animals in one area, and then you tend to see much larger animals further away from that? This is that animal that I just showed you. So this is the pouch lampreys. It's a much larger animal, right? American brook lampreys, on the other hand, are much, much smaller. These are animals that would easily fit into your hand. Let me talk a little bit about the methods. I looked at a couple different uh, streams, three different ones. But I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about the Genesee River. But I do want you to be aware that I also did sample uh, the Deer River and Trout Brook. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna only show you stuff from Trout Book uh, and the Genesee River, really. Um, these two rivers are uh, rivers where there are only American brook lamprey. There are actually also Northern brook lamprey, which is another species of brook lamprey, in the Deer River, and I'll come to that a little later in the talk and just get, and talk about why that's a little unique. So let's start at the Genesee River. I'm gonna show you some of the sites just to give you an idea about what these different sites look like for these animals. So, this is a site that's on a fairly large section of the river. You'll see that in just a second when I show you the picture. I took, uh, this, is, this animal was collected in August, and there are, uh, here's some characteristics that are associated with that, right? These water temperatures are cool, uh, but not super cold. Um, pH is relatively high there. And even though this is 
is a fairly large section of the river. The river depth is fairly low, even though this, the, the stream is actually already 40 meters wide. Right now. And that's what that would look like, right? So that's actually not what we think of necessarily as traditional American broken every habitat, um, but there absolutely were lots of animals in, the, in these kind of areas. Here's another example. So this is a little bit further up in the headwaters, right? So this is a storm in the Genesee River. <clears throat> and what I'm, you can see here, stream depth again is very, very shallow. But the stream at this point is already half as wide as it was in the previous example. And this looks more like a traditional trout fishing habitat. And shout out to uh, fishing access points produced by the TDC. Really enjoy going to those sites um, and being able to get into the stream and, and get access to my lamperies while other people are looking for trout of various kinds. But uh, this area actually is very, very productive for lampreys apparently. What's just off the screen here is a large pool which is forming right off this ripple. Um, and that's a lot of soft sediments which the lamprey are using to rear in that area. And then here's what I would say is a, a traditional uh, American brook lamprey habitat. This is a headwater stream, so the, this stream of course is getting very shallow, but the width is also very, very, very uh, narrow, right? This is basically like a little tiny canal. Um, and there's not much in it, right? This is a very traditional American brook lamprey habitat. Um, there's other fish in here as well, but there are also a lot of American brook lamprey. You just don't see them when you go to these streams. So what I did for this was I would go to a site, I'd mark out an area where I'd expect to find American brook lamprey, which is basically sandy or muddy habitat, slack water areas. Uh, I would sample that up to four times and, and to deplete all the animals out of that area. And then within a river system, I would sample with the end of a very short period of time. So here I have three days. Most of these were done within 48 hours. And that was to make sure that you're not seeing differences between the road. You're seeing that snapshot of that river at that moment when I went out. <clears throat> For animals that I captured, um, I took their length and weight, and then I would release them at that site. So I wasn't doing lots of uh, removal collection here. So this is the length distribution of animals in the Genesee River. What I want you to, to just keep in mind here if you look is this, this river that you're looking at is exactly the same as what I showed you before. Uh, what I've now put on top of it is the length frequencies. And I'm, I'm actually going to have you look at first is up here. So that, let's start here and then we'll work around. This area right here is, a, is that very shallow headwater type area. And what you tend to see is you see a big pulse of very, very small animals, and then you see a distribution of other sizes. Uh, and th these animals right here are, are almost certainly young up here, right? They're very, very tiny relative to the rest of the animals. If you move just downriver from that, what you see is there's a huge uh, sort of broad band of what are probably a lot of different animals of year. Um, and then there are these same groups probably within that, uh, and then other sizes appear there as well. And if you move even further down the river, actually young of year fully drop out in this case, so I didn't capture any young of year a little bit further down. But we do have lots of sizes of other animals in that case. And if you move down the river again, what you find is young of year suddenly reappear in that population. Um, and then again, if you move just a little bit down from there, you get a much uh, more uh, broad distribution of animals, but you tend to get those up here. And you can see that pattern repeat as you move up here, right? Here's an area where there's lots and lots of young of the year, not a lot of other animals of, of any sizes. If you move just a little bit further down from that, then you get that broader distribution of sizes, but the total young of the year dropped out very right large. Same thing up here, I'm not all the way up into the headwaters um, in this case, and so what you see here is you tend to get a lot of young of the year, uh, but they are also other sizes, and probably if I had sampled just a little bit further up, you'd expect to see a broader or a, a higher peak of young of the year. Um, this is a really good example of exactly what you want to see if you want to do like, by age, right? There's really nice peaks, and they're really evenly stacked away from each other. So those pet peaks are probably showing you age 0, 1, and 2 animals. This is a different river system, but you're going to see a similar pattern here. Uh, in this case, uh, this is fairly high in the headwaters, but I didn't get all the way up into the headwaters, but I'm still getting uh, a fairly nice distribution of animals. In this case, I have a situation where young of year drop out. Uh, in this area right here, which tends to be riffles, again, we're not getting a lot of young of year, but if you move just beyond that again, you get a lot of young of year, and then they drop out as you move down the river again. This is the last uh, uh, river that I sampled, and this one's a little bit unique because it has Northern Brook Lamprey and American Brook Lamprey, and by and large, what I found is that if Northern Brook and American Brook Lamprey, when I went out and sampled, did not overlap, uh, mostly down in the lower reaches, I found northern brook lamprey. It, this is fairly high, but it's still further down. And when I went up into the upper reaches, that's where you found American brook lamprey. Only at this site did I find both northern and American brook lamprey, and it was by 
by and large for a number of plant prey. But the pattern is similar again. You get lots of little guys up here in the headwaters. You tend not to see lots of little guys as you move further down the river, but you do get a broader distribution of sizes. So let's just look at the length frequency or the length weight relationship of these guys. So our American work plant prey in the areas that I sample, are they the same everywhere in New York? These are animals from Trout Brook, so this is up at the St. Lawrence. You can place up Deer River, which again is, is also in the St. Lawrence region, and then you can place Genesee River on top of it. And okay, so American work plant prey, at least in the areas I went to, are all doing the same thing as far as length weight is concerned. The other thing that you'll notice is that this relationship fits really, really well when you're down here and say animals under 200 millimeters, and then when you get up past that, they really drift away from that line. And that's actually not unsurprising. So lampreys spend probably the last year of their life or about that long building up fat reserves in their body and are probably not really increasing in length. We know that's true for sea lamprey. We suspect it's true for other lamprey. And this seems to suggest very much so that yes, this, that this pattern will also hold for things like American brook lamprey. These animals are probably drifting away from that very strong uh, increase in length, but still increasing in weight because they're adding a lot of mass as they prepare to go through and, and reproduce. So all these animals are probably getting ready to uh, reproduce, probably not in the year that I went out, but the year following they would be ready to go out and start to reproduce. I, this is the northern brook lamprey I captured. I just wanted to compare them with American brook lamprey for you. Northern brook lamprey are a little bit smaller. You can see that American brook lamprey that I sampled went well up into the 200. The largest northern brook I have is about 150 millimeters, so these are quite a bit smaller. If you zoom in now, um, you'll see that that sort of wandering away from that, that fit line, probably also the case with northern brook lamprey. They don't seem to fit terribly well at those larger sizes, so we probably expect that they're doing the same thing. You have to capture a lot more uh, northern brook lamprey to be sure. But northern brook lamprey are a much smaller species, so that I just want to give you a visual representation of what that is. Uh, these are scaled to the same size. This is a, a fairly large northern brook lamprey, and this is a more average size American brook lamprey. So this, that 50 millimeters is a huge difference in fecundity, right? There's a lot more eggs than an American brook lamprey can produce, uh, but it probably takes longer to get to that size. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was the young year. So that young year stuff was really interesting when you looked at those length frequency distributions. It really did suggest something very interesting was going on. But if you zoom in, it's even a little more interesting than that. And when you zoom in just on what is probably young year, you'll notice a couple things. Um, in places where animals can only come from very local areas, so if you go into a headwater again up here in this, this very this small creek, where there really isn't a lot of opportunity to go any further up river, that's almost the extent that they can go up river, what you'll find is that the, the young of here are almost all the same size. So that makes sense. They're probably all coming from the same area. They've all lived in that area. They're all experiencing the same growth in that area in the same way. And they're all, they're all doing the same thing, right? There may be some winners and some losers, but by and large, they're coming up about the same way. If you move a little bit further down river from that site, even just a tiny bit, what you'll see is that distribution flattens out and broadens very, very rapidly. And that suggests a couple of things. One is that animals are not moving a lot, right? And when they do, they're in that site for a relatively long period of time. It also suggests that there's growth, different growing conditions elsewhere in the river, right? Even on very, very local scales, on thousands of meters, you're talking about different growth conditions. And it may even suggest that this river has American brook lamprey in it, right? You, you wouldn't necessarily not anticipate that, but just by that size frequency, you're able to say there probably are animals coming from another population nearby. And if you go down river, keep in mind there's no young deer captured here, but if you go down river again, what you'll see is that again, the, the size frequency is stacked up, so these are pretty tightly constrained, um, but the average size of this animal here is 45 millimeters, and this one is coming in at maybe, maybe at 40, so the growing conditions are a little bit better for these guys down river, but you don't see that broad peak, so these animals aren't drifting all the way down river, they're probably staying relatively localized when they drift, um, at least as young animals, so they're not hugely connected in that way, right? It probably takes years for them to travel long distances in the surface. And last but not least down here, I wanted to show you this point because I think it's interesting. So this area right here, of course, does have American brook lamprey, and we know that there's American brook lamprey in this stream. And what you see again is these, what look like almost three peaks combined together. And that's because you're, again, you're at an area where there's lots of potential influences, there's probably lots of different growing conditions that are coming up, and you're probably getting an assortment of lots and lots of different animals washing into that area. 
and making those very different size distributions. So what we're going to say about uh, larval American growth plant birds. Well, they do show patterns of size distribution. Now, it's not as clear as what I showed you in that first picture uh, um, from the animals from New Zealand, where you had this very obvious, here are the nursery habitats, here are the rearing habitats. But what you are seeing is that they are staggered throughout the river. So just because you have American brook land in the river doesn't mean that all, popular, all the animals in that river are either exchanging all the time. They mostly have them segregated in probably these little pockets, and that's probably dependent on things like hydrology and the shape of uh, of the river and things like how uh, rain events change the flow over certain things uh, during certain parts of the year. Spawning does occur for American brook lamprey apparently throughout the river, right? So the Genesee River population apparently has spawning populations all throughout it, so these animals are, are, are breeding everywhere. And then growth rates are really, really variable, right? even within what we think of as the same system. Uh, but the length weight uh, pattern for American brook lamprey is probably pretty similar. And then part of the problem with the lampreys is that we love to age them. They don't have oglets, so we have a hard time doing that. And sometimes we rely on length frequencies. And one of the problems with length frequencies, and this is a real thing now, uh, is that they don't show good patterns of growth. And that's not maybe because the animal's not growing uh, in the same way all its life. It's because when it does make these leaps to these other populations, so it washes through the population, you're seeing a very different signal suddenly appear in another population and it draws out and it just it, it makes it harder to observe that actual growth pattern that you would necessarily expect with just a length frequency distribution. So not a solution to that, but I'm just warning you ahead of time. Um, and then finally, Norman Brooklyn Amber appear to be smaller, and it's possible just based on where that maybe that's something to do with things like uh, mortality differences so they live lower in the, the river system because it, they grow faster and therefore can reproduce faster, or is it just a, a matter of me going on sampling that one year and that's just where they happen to be for that year? All right, with that, I take any questions and thank you for your time. Yeah, so statolids have been used uh, to, to age lampreys. They usually work. Um, they probably would work, and, and I would consider doing that. They are much more difficult. They're much smaller relative to oglets, um, and they're a little bit harder to read. But yeah, that would be something to do, is go out and collect statolids from populations. And, and there wouldn't be any ray or other hard structure to overlap in these guys, unfortunately. So you'd be stuck. Uh, only looking at either tablets or like frequencies. Could you do snorkel surveys and, and survey them? So I don't know if you could ever see a lamprey head emerge from a substrate, which is what people say that they do, and I actually have kept them in the lab, and they do that when oxygen levels get low, but I haven't had them do that during the day. They're really, uh, they don't like to emerge uh, when, when any light is on. And so, unfortunately, I suspect you can't. The other problem is, I have seen them, of course, burrow in the wild, and the burrows they make are basically indistinguishable from any small invertebrate that burrows in the subject. But you just anticipated my question, because I was going to say, but what about doing it at night? Doing it at night would be interesting. I don't know how active they are, I, I, and uh, it would be cool to spend time with like an infrared camera over an area where you knew there were a lot, and see if you could have animals emerge. I think you also get a decent idea about how many animals are there by doing things like uh, setting on trip nets and collecting in one year when they're available, because uh, you'll get a lot of animals that way too. Another question, not to try to put you in the spot a whole lot, but do you find any uh, conservation implications in this study? So for the American work lamber, I think the good news is you don't need to protect lots of habitat, right? So the management takeaway there is if you've got just even a little bit of habitat, they're probably okay. They can complete that life cycle on a relatively short stretch. And that means that lots of fragmentation along their uh, reach maybe is on the really long term is maybe something to, to look out for because of a population when extinct it may be hard for it to recover. But they're actually going to be probably pretty resilient in that way. For larger lampreys, uh, you are probably going to have to think of that scaled up. So if you're thinking about animals like the Ohio lamprey, the silver lamprey, you're probably still going to think about fragmentation, but now you're probably instead of thinking on the order of a couple of kilometers, you're probably thinking on the order of tens of kilometers. So if you have lots and lots and lots of chopping of that habitat, they probably won't survive in those kind of areas. But if you can even protect uh, relative stretches that would be available, they might be able to persist in those habitats. Great, thanks. Okay, we're going to move on.